Namo tassa bagawato arahato sama sambutasa namo tassa bagawato arahato sama sambutasa namo tassa bagawato arahato sama sambutasa So we'll continue on with our study of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta the Sutta of the Buddha's uh, passing and we're into the fourth chapter Last time we uh, had the uh, encounter of the last encounter of Buddha with Mara, and we had Ananda failing to take the hint and not asking the Buddha to remain for a, a full, full uh, Ayukapa, you know, live to his full hundred years. And the Buddha is now 80 years old, and he's relinquished his life principle. He said he'll take a uh, Parinibbana in three months, and he's continuing with his travels through India to visit places and communities for the last time. So we'll begin. Then the Lord, having risen early and dressed, took his robe and bowl and went into Vesali for alms. Having returned from the alms round and eaten, he looked back at Vesali with his elephant look and said, Ananda, this is the last time that the Tagata will look upon Vesali. Now we will go to Bandagama. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord proceeded with a large company of monks to Bandagama and stayed there. So the, the elephant look, that refers to uh, a characteristic of Buddhas, that when they want to uh, look in any direction, they don't just turn their head, they turn their entire body like an elephant. That's called the, the elephant look of the Tathagata. And then the Lord addressed the monks. It is monks through not understanding, not penetrating four things that I, as well as you, have for a long time fared on round the cycle of rebirths. What are the four? Through not understanding the Orion morality, through not understanding the Orion concentration, through not understanding the Orion wisdom, through not understanding the Orion liberation. So that's Sila, Samadhi, uh, Panya, and Wimuti. I, as well as you, have for a long time fared on around the cycle of rebirths, and it is by understanding and penetrating the Orion morality, the Orion concentration, the Orion wisdom, and the Orion liberation that the craving has been cut off. The tendency towards becoming has been exhausted, and there will be no more rebirth. Sila, Samadhi, and Panya, that's a short version of the Eightfold Path, which includes those factors of um, morality, of concentration, and of wisdom. And Umuti is the, the result of the, or liberation is the result of, of walking the path. Thus the Lord spoke. The welfare having thus spoken, the teacher said this. And then we have one, one stanza of verse. This is a common form in many suttas that the, the teaching will then be expressed again in, in verse. Morality, samadhi, wisdom, and final release. These glorious things Gotama came to know. The Dhamma he discovered, he taught his monks. He whose vision ended woe to Nibbana is gone. You don't really appreciate the um, the poetry in the English translation, which is pretty much a prose translation. But in Pali, the verse forms depends on meter and sometimes alliteration. Rhyming is not so much used because with an inflected language, rhyming is just too easy. It rhymes anyway all the time. So, but there there are strict meter in strict. There are several different meters in which stanzas can be expressed, and they there'll be a combination of long and short syllables in a certain pattern and order. Then the Lord, while staying at Bandagama, delivered a comprehensive discourse. This is as we've seen him do in, in each at each stop. He delivers a comprehensive discourse because a summary of the teaching. This is morality. This is concentration. This is wisdom. Concentration, when imbued with morality, brings great fruit and profit. 
Wisdom, and when imbued with concentration, brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom becomes completely free from the corruptions. That is, the corruption of sensuality, of becoming, of false views and of ignorance. And when the Lord had stayed at Bandagama for as long as he wished, he said, Ananda, let us go to Hatigama, to Ambagama, to Jambugama. In the text, it's abbreviated with ellipses. Like it's the, whole, the whole discourse would be repeated, giving the same discourse in each place. Then he said, Ananda, let us go to Boganagara. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Boganagara. At Boganagara, the Lord stayed at the Ananda shrine. And there he said to the monks, Monks, I will teach you four criteria. Listen, pay close attention, and I will speak. Yes, Lord, replied the monks. Suppose a monk were to say, Friends, I have heard and received this from the Lord's own lips. This is the Dhamma, this is the discipline, this is the Master's teaching. Then, monks, you should neither approve nor disapprove his words. Then, without approving or disapproving, his words and expressions should be carefully noted and compared with the suttas and reviewed in the light of the discipline, that means the vinya. If they, on such comparison and review, are found not to conform to the suttas or the discipline, the conclusion must be, surely this is not the word of the Buddha. It has been wrongly understood by this monk, and the matter is to be rejected. But when on such comparison and review they are found to conform to the suttas or to the discipline, the conclusion must be, surely this is the word of the Buddha. It is rightly understood by this monk. This is the first criterion. Suppose a monk were to say, in such and such a place, there is a community with elders and distinguished teachers. I have heard and received this from that community. Then, monks, you should neither approve nor disapprove his words. And the whole uh, paragraph is repeated to check against the suttas and vinaya. This is the second criteria. Suppose a monk were to say, in such and such a place, there are many elders who are learned, bearers of the tradition, who know the Dhamma, the discipline, the code of rules, etc. This is the third criterion. Suppose a monk were to say, in such a, such a place, there is one elder who is learned. I have received and heard this from the elder. And then the whole criterion is rephrased. But where on such comparison and review they are found to conform to the suttas and the discipline, then the conclusion must be, assuredly, this is the word of the Buddha. This has been rightly understood by this monk. So the Buddha is giving here a, a, a way of evaluating teachings that you might hear from different places and different teachers if they are in accord with what's known to have been taught in the suttas and, and in the vinaya, then they can be accepted, if not there to be rejected. Then the Lord, while staying at Boganagara, delivered a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. And when the Lord had stayed at Boganagara for as long as he wished, he said, Ananda, let us go to Pawa. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Pawa, where he stayed at the mango grove of Chunda the smith. And Chunda heard that the Lord had arrived at Pawa and was staying in the mango grove. So he went to the Lord, saluted him, and sat down on one side. And the Lord instructed, fired, and delighted him with the talk on Dhamma. Then Chunda said, May the Lord accept a meal from me tomorrow with the order of monks. And the Lord consented by silence. And Chunda, understanding his consent, rose from the seat, saluted the Lord, and passing by to his right, departed. And as the night was ending, Chunda had a fine meal of hard and soft food prepared, with an abundance of pig's delight. And when it was ready, he replied to the Lord, Lord, the meal is ready. So I'll uh, explain a few of these, uh, these um, culinary terms here. Hard and soft food is a, is a phrase that occurs often, uh, particularly in the Vinaya. Um, that's uh, bojana and kandaniya. And the distinction is that soft food is uh, considered to be the staples, which were in 
Finia definition, there's it's grains like rice and um, meat and fish. They're uh, soft food, and hard food is is everything else. I think the terms soft and hard are really misleading. I think that's more just of a convention of the translators. So fruit and vegetables and so on were classed as hard food. The distinction is not really important in the Theravada Vinaya, but it's a detail in the Sarvastivada Vinaya, which is close, but has some, some interesting differences. In the Sarvastivada Vinaya, the rule for the monks eating is, as in the Theravada, they can only eat between dawn and noon, but they are explicitly allowed to take uh, soft food that is staples only at one sitting in that time but they can have hard food outside of the meal, but during the morning time only. So they could have a breakfast of fruit or something and then have the, the full meal. That distinction doesn't occur in a Theravada. It's often a kind of a puzzle why the, why it's even, the distinction is even made and defined because it, it's, it doesn't really apply in any of the rules. And the, the important one here is the, uh, the term pig's delight. That is in... Um, that's the, uh, Maurice Walsh's translation of the Pali. The Pali was Sukara Madawa, which uh, Sukara is pig and Madawa is uh, that which pleases or delights. And there's a controversy over what that is. The um, Mahayana traditions that, that are strict vegetarian and don't want to have the Buddha eating meat, they think it means something that pigs delight in, and they usually interpret it as mushrooms or truffles. And I think the general consensus in Theravada is it's some kind of fancy pork dish. But anyway, th this, this becomes important. Whatever it was, whether it was pork or mushrooms, it becomes a, has a importance here. Then the Lord, having dressed in the morning, took his robe and bowl and went with his order of monks to Chunda's dwelling, where he sat down on the prepared seat and said, Serve the pig's delight that has been prepared to me, and serve the remaining hard and soft food to the order of monks. Very good, Lord, said Chunda, and did so. Then the Lord said to Chunda, Whatever is left over of the pig's delight, you should bury it in a pit. Because, Chunda, I can see none in this world with its Dewas, Maras, and Brahmins, in this generation with its ascetics and Brahmins, its princes and people, if they were to eat it, could thoroughly digest it, except the Tathagata. Very good, Lord, said Chunda, and having buried the remains of the pig's delight in a pit, he came to the Lord, saluted him, and sat down to one side, and the Lord, having instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted him with all his talk, with a talk on the Dhamma, rose from his seat and departed. Then, after having eaten the meal provided by Chunda, the Lord was attacked by a severe sickness with bloody diarrhea and with sharp pains as if he were about to die. But he endured all this mindfully and clearly aware and without complaint. And then the Lord said, Ananda, let us go to Kasanagara. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And then we have the uh, paragraph in verse again, which is translated more or less as prose. It's just shown as that the, the, um, the spacing is, indicates it as a, as a verse. Having eaten Chanda's meal, this I have heard, he suffered a grave illness, painful deathly, from eating a meal of pig's delight. Grave sickness assailed the teacher. Having purged, the Lord then said, now I'll go to Kusanara town. So, the Buddha, we see here the Buddha uh, specifically ordered no one else to eat this Sukara Madhava. This is only the Tathagata can thoroughly digest this. So this was the, um, you know, some kind of food poisoning. You know, this was the uh, trigger that brought on his, his death. And he had... Uh, we recall that from previous reading that he had given up the life principle. He'd abandoned the life principle, which is within his power as an enlightened being. He can sort of has some control over the time of his death. And he said, uh, uh, 
have abandoned the life principle. And this is, becomes the convenient mechanism to uh, bring about the, the final dissolution of his, his physical form. And it's, it's obvious he knew that this, uh, this food was, was uh, dangerous, fatal, really, because he, he ordered no one else to eat it and had the rest of it buried. So it, it looks like uh, it looks like he took this opportunity that presented him by circumstance to um, to be the trigger to finally make an end. Then turning aside from the road, the Lord went to the foot of a tree and said, "Come, Ananda, fold a robe in four for me. I am tired and wish to sit down." Very good, Lord," said Ananda, and did so. Then the Lord sat down on the prepared seat and said, Ananda, bring me some water. I am thirsty and want to drink. Ananda replied, Lord, 500 carts have passed this way. The water is churned up by their wheels and is not good. It is dirty and disturbed. But Lord, the river Kakuta nearby has clean water, pleasant, cool, pure, with beautiful banks and delightful. There the Lord shall drink the water and cool his limbs. A second time, the Lord said, Ananda, bring me some water. And Ananda replied as before. A third time the Lord said, bring me some water. I am thirsty and want to drink. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And taking his bowl, he went to the stream. And that stream whose water had been churned up by the wheels and was not good, dirty and disturbed, as Ananda approached, it began to flow pure, bright, and unsullied. And the venerable Ananda thought, Wonderful, marvelous are the Tathagata's great and mighty powers. This water was churned up by wheels, and at my approach it flowed pure and bright and unsullied. He took water in his bowl, brought it to the Lord, and told him of his thought, saying, May the Lord drink the water, and may the welfare drink. And the Lord drank the water too. So in this translation we see the Buddha referred to as Lord and as welfare. Uh, Lord would be a uh, Bhagawa and um, welfare would be Sugata. At that moment, Pukasa the Mala, a pupil of Alara Kalama, Alara Kalama was one of the um, so called heretic teachers, one of the kind of rivals of Buddhism at the time, that often come up as characters in these stories, it was going along the main road from Kusanara to Pawa. Seeing the Lord sitting under a tree, he went over, saluted him, and sat down to one side. Then he said, It is wonderful, it is marvelous, how calm these wanderers are. Once, Lord, Alara Kalama was going along the main road, and turning aside, he went and sat down under a nearby tree to take his siesta. And five hundred carts went rumbling by very close to him. A man who was walking along behind him came to Alara Kalama and said, Lord, did you not see 500 carts go by? No, friend, I did not. But did you not hear them, Lord? No, friend, I did not. Well, were you asleep, Lord? No, friend, I was not asleep. Then, Lord, were you conscious? Yes, friend. So, Lord, being conscious and awake, you neither saw nor heard 500 carts passing close by you, even though your outer robe was bespattered with dust. That is so, friend. And the man thought, it is wonderful, it is marvelous. These wanderers are so calm that though conscious and awake, a man neither saw nor heard 500 carts passing close by. And he went away praising Alara Kalama's lofty power. Well, Pukasa, said the Buddha, what do you think? What do you consider is more difficult to do or attain while conscious and awake, not to see or hear 500 carts passing nearby? or while conscious and awake, not to see or hear anything when the rain god splashes and streams, when lightning flashes and thunder crashes. Lord, how can one compare not seeing or hearing 500 carts with that, or even six, seven, eight, nine, or ten hundred, or hundreds or thousands of carts to that? To see or hear nothing when such a storm rages is more difficult. Once Pukasa, when I was staying at Atuma, in the, at the threshing floor, the rain god streamed and splashed, lightning flashed and thunder crashed. Then two farmers, brothers, and four oxen were killed, and a lot of people went out of Atuma to where the two brothers and four oxen were killed. And Pukasa, 
I had at that time gone out of the door of the threshing floor and was walking up and down outside, and the man from the crowd came to me, saluted me, and stood by to one side, and I said to him, Friend, why are all these people gathered here? Lord, there has been a great storm, and two farmers' brothers and four oxen have been killed. But you, Lord, where have you been? I have been right here, friend. But what did you see, Lord? I saw nothing, friend. Or what did you hear, Lord? I heard nothing, friend. Were you sleeping, Lord? I was not sleeping, friend. Then, Lord, were you conscious? Yes, friend. So, Lord, being conscious and awake, you neither saw nor heard the great rainfall and floods and the thunder and lightning. That is so, friend. And Pocasa, that that man thought, it is wonderful, it is marvelous. These wanderers are so calm that they neither see nor hear when the rain god streams and splashes, lightning flashes and thunder crashes. Proclaiming my lofty powers, he saluted me, passed by to the right and departed. So what we, what's happening here is that um, the Buddha is entering into a deep jhana and is in a state of jhana, he's secluded from the sense bases so thoroughly that even a, a mighty storm occurs, it, he, he, is, he is not aware of it. He is uh, fully conscious and awake, but not, uh, not receiving sense impressions. As one uh, progresses through the jhanas, the meditator becomes more and more isolated from the senses. In first jhana, that's rather weak, so there's a saying that sound is a thorn to first jhana because although you're somewhat removed from the senses, you can still be disturbed by a loud sound and break your jhana. But this becomes increasingly less so as you progress through the through the jhanas. So the Buddha would, would have been very a master of all states of meditation. So he would have been completely by his own choice and action, you know, meditative action, he had insulated himself from the senses. At this, Pukasa the Mala said, Lord, I reject the lofty powers of Alara Kalama as if they were blown away by a mighty wind or carried off by a swift stream or river. Excellent, Lord, excellent. It is as if someone were to set up what has been knocked down or to point out the way to one who has got lost or to bring an oil lamp into a dark place so that those with eyes could see what was there. Just so the blessed Lord has expounded the Dhamma in various ways. And I, Lord, go for refuge to the Blessed Lord, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. May the Blessed Lord accept me from this day forth as a lay follower as long as life shall last. Then Pukasa said to one man, Go and fetch me two fine sets of robes of cloth of gold, burnished and ready to wear. Yes, Lord, the man replied, and did so. And Pukasa offered the robes to the Lord, saying, Here, Lord, are two fine sets of robes of cloth of gold. May the blessed Lord be gracious and be pleased to accept them. Well then, Bukasa, clothe me in one set and Ananda in the other. Very good, Lord, said Bukasa, and did so. Then the Lord instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted Bukasa the Mala with a talk on Dhamma. Then Bukasa rose from his seat, saluted the Lord, passed by to, to the right, and departed. Soon after Bukasa had gone, Ananda, having arranged one set of golden robes on the body of the Lord, observed that against the Lord's body it appeared dulled, and he said, It is wonderful, Lord, it is marvelous, how clear and bright the Lord's skin appears. It looks even brighter than the golden robes in which it is clothed. Just so, Ananda, there are two occasions on which the Tathagata's skin appears especially clear and bright. Which are they? One is the night in which the Tathagata gains supreme enlightenment. The other is the night when he attains the Nibbana element without remainder at his final passing. On these two occasions, the Tathagata's skin appears especially clear and bright. Tonight, Ananda, in the last watch, in the cell grove of the Malas, near Kusanara, between two cell trees, the Tathagata's final passing will take place. And now, Ananda, let us go to the river Kakuta. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And then the two lines of verse. Two golden robes were Pukasa's offering. Brighter shone the teacher's body than its dress. 
So the Buddha is going to pass away between two cell trees. It's a it's been noted by by others that all the important events in the Buddha's life happen out of doors under trees. That he was born under a tree. His mother gave birth in in the open air, holding on to, to the branch of a tree. You know, he was enlightened under a tree. He gave his first sermon in a grove, and here he's passing away under in between two cell trees. Then the Lord went with a large number of monks to the river Kakuta. He entered the water, bathed and drank, and emerging, went to the mango grove, where he said to the venerable Chundaka, Come, Chundaka, fold a robe in four for me. I am tired and want to lie down. Very good, Lord, said Kudaka, and did so. Then the Lord adopted the lion's posture, lying on his right side, placing one foot on the other, mindfully and with clear awareness bearing in mind the time of awakening, and the venerable Chundaka sat down in front of the Lord. Then we have a, another verse. The Buddha, having gone to Kakuta the river with its clear, bright, and pleasant waters, therein the teacher plunged his weary body. The Tagata, without equal in the world, surrounded by the monks whose head he was, the teacher and Lord, preserver of the Dhamma, to the mango grove the great sage went, and to Chundaka the monk he said, On a fourfold robe I'll lie down. And thus abjured by the great adept, Chundaka placed the fourfold robe. The teacher laid his weary limbs to rest, while Chundaka kept watch beside him. Then the Lord said to the venerable Ananda, It might happen, Ananda, that Chunda the smith should feel remorse, thinking, It is your fault, friend Chunda. It is by your misdeed that the Tagata gained final Nibbana after taking his last meal from you. But Chunda's remorse should be expelled in this way. This is your merit, Chunda. This is your good deed, that the Tagata gained final Nibbana after taking his last meal from you. For, friend Chunda, I have heard and understood from the Lord's own lips that these two almsgivings are a very great fruit, a very great result more fruitful and more advantageous than any other, which two? The one is the almsgiving after eating which the Tathagata gains supreme enlightenment. The other, that after which he attains the Nibbana element without remainder at his final passing. These two almsgivings are more fruitful and profitable than all others. Shunda's deed is conducive to long life, to good looks, to happiness, to fame, to heaven and to lordship. In this way, Ananda, Chunda's remorse is to be expelled. So the the, the first offering was the uh, the offering of Sujata, the um, the milkmaid, who um, gave uh, the Bodhisatta a bowl of milk rice, which gave him the strength to make his uh, his great uh, great sitting in which he attained enlightenment. So that's the. Uh, the first uh, most meritorious gift. And the second is the gift of food given uh, for the last meal of the Tagata before he passes away. So the Buddha is being compassionate here and he's realizing that Chunda may take it badly and think, I killed the Buddha with my pig's delight. <laughs> and he just, you know, just, you know, tell him, tell him to chill out. He's fine. He's, he's made a great merit. You know, don't... Uh, don't be hard on yourself. Then the Lord, having settled this matter, at this time uttered this verse. By giving merit grows, by restraint hatred is checked. He who skilled abandons evil things. As greed, hate, and folly wane, Nibbana is gained. And that uh, completes the fourth chapter. So we now have the Buddha that they were coming up to the the climax of the of the uh, the story the the buddha is now at the site of his decease and uh, he's taken his last meal and uh, this is the night when he passes into parinibbana is has begun